list some book resources. I need to get that. Magic Yoni, guys. All right, guys. If you haven't gotten a glass of water, a notebook, uh, please get one because we're going to share some gems today. I want to welcome all of you who are tuning in to The Power of the Pelvis. I'm joined by Origin. Well, I'm going to let them explain you know, who they are and what they're here, um, what they're about. But I'm super, super honored to be partnering with them on this event to learn about and teach about the power of our pelvic from the physical standpoint and also the spiritual standpoint. I'm super honored because being in the wellness industry, nobody's doing this. Like people are not talking about, you know, the person as a whole body, health and wellness as a whole from the spiritual standpoint and the physical standpoint. So I'm super, super honored. Um, do you guys wanna introduce yourselves and then I'll kick it off with um, my part of the presentation. Sure, yeah, I can kick it off. Um, so I'm Allison, I lead marketing at Origin. Um, we are so excited to be here with Melanie. I know she is just an incredible community and, um, and really like we, what, what we do at the end of the day is try to help women and people with vaginal anatomy better understand and feel like feel comfortable and confident in their bodies. And we do that through pelvic floor and full body physical therapy. So we'll talk a lot about, um, your pelvis and your pelvic floor and how that all interrelates. We're really excited to, um, I think talk a lot about the mind body connection and, and the prevalence there. Um, but really excited to be here and meet this incredible community. And I'm actually, I am a doctor of physical therapy and I specialize in pelvic health. I have um, certification in obstetrics and pelvic health, and I treat pelvic floor dysfunction, um, including pelvic pain and um, pain in pregnancy, sexual dysfunction, bowel, bladder dysfunction, postpartum recovery. Um, all of the things related to your pelvic health and wellness. Um, I've taught courses in women's health, physical therapy to physical therapy students and clinicians across the, the nation. So I'm so excited to be here today with you guys to kind of spread the good word more on um, how you can help yourself in, in, in your pelvic health. Thank you all so much. I'm super excited. I'm going to kick it off with explaining the more spiritual aspect, because you guys always know, if you've been to one of my workshops before, I love, like it is such a passion of mine to talk about health and wellness, but I always start off with this. We are spiritual beings living human experiences. So I wanna kick it off first and then pass it over to Dr. Ashley Rollins. So let me share my screen. Hopefully I'm doing this right, let's see. <laughs> can you guys see my screen? Are we looking at this beautiful picture of a pelvis yeah. right now? Let me make sure that I can see my chat. So I can see you guys talking. Perfect. So we are going to be talking about the power of the pelvis, something that we all have, yet we know so little about, a place where many of us experience pain and discomfort, yet also know little about and are often overlooked when we talk to our doctors about it. Who resonates with that? Having any sort of like pain or discomfort in your pelvic area, whether you deal with um, some type of disease. I see a me with exclamation points and history, yeah. which is, I don't want to say it's amazing. It sucks, you know, have, going through pain and not being able to uh, have somebody see you. Um, so we, we go through these things and we go to our doctors and we, we're often not seen and not heard, especially as women of color, which most of us are here. If we look at healing from a more holistic standpoint, looking at the whole person that we can interpret and heal diseases or dis-ease, uh, in the body through other systems of healing. So if you know me, you know that I am an intuitive energy healer. I can read energy. So I'm always, always talking about um, health and wellness from an energetic standpoint. So I am going to be talking about um, the pelvis from an energetic standpoint first. All of our body parts and systems connect to a particular energy center. And what I'm gonna be sharing comes from the ancient Indian chakra system dating all the way back from 500 BC. I always like to say that because I cannot claim the chakra system. I also wanna take this time to correct everybody who has ever pronounced chakra as chakra. It is chakra, guys, <laughs> chakra. <laughs> um, Chakra literally means wheel and refers to the energy points in our body. Um, it's sort of like a spinning disc, like an energetic disc. Uh, there are seven of them uh, that correspond to our nerves, our major organs, uh, and our emotional and physical well being. The pelvis, let me make sure that I'm ready to click so there's no suspense. The pelvis is a part of our human body, but it directly corresponds to a chakra in our, energe in our energetic body 
and that is the sacral chakra. Are we seeing the next slide? Yes, yes, let me know in the chat. The pelvis is part of our physical body, but it directly corresponds to our sacral chakra. It is the second chakra. It's located in our pelvic area or the sacrum. And the sacral chakra is super, super special. You guys might know me from back in the day when I recorded uh, manifestation videos using the moon um, on YouTube, where you may know me from my manifestation and abundance workshops um, that I've held over the years. When, if ever I have spoken to you about using the energy that you innately have to manifest, I've been talking about working from your sacral chakra. So, ta-da. Um, the sacral chakra directly governs our creativity, hello, our manifestation, our ability to create our emotions, our intimacy, our sexuality, our sensuality, and our abundance and manifestation. It's also associated with the color orange, the moon, which is why a lot of people say, you know, instead of saying they're on my period, I'm on my period, I'm on my moon, um, because we correspond, they correspond with the moon cycles. And it also corresponds to the element of water. Okay, so excited to bring you guys this information. When we talk about um, the sacral chakra, it's in our womb area. And it basically, again, dictates the ability to create and manifest the energy in our life. When it is in balance, a balanced sacral chakra, you will experience a life or you know, an existence that is energetic. You're gonna be joyful. You're gonna be honest, uh, open, forgiving, able to give and receive in our relationships. Uh, able to express creativity openly, whether it is actual creativity, whether you're an artist um, or not. We're all artists of life, so able to create your experiences with ease. Uh, you're comfortable with your sensuality and your sexuality. You're comfortable with receiving and giving pleasure. You are uh, sexually fertile and your hormones are balanced, which means you probably have regular periods. Now, with balance comes disbalance. An unbalanced sacral chakra I gave a little bit of both here. Are you guys seeing this slide? This is probably the most important. This is going to segue into the rest of the workshop. Not many people know that one, like I said earlier, um, our physical disbalances, unbalances have energetic roots. So when we have an unbalanced sacral chakra, we're going to experience, I gave you both from emotional uh, disbalances to like physical stuff, things that show up in our body. So we're going to be emotionally unstable where we might be withdrawn or codependent. You can be, you can have an overactive or underactive chakra. Uh, resentful, guilty, jealous, angry, creatively blocked, again, artistically, but also not able to create the experiences that you want to feel in the world with ease. You may experience depression or low energy, low libido as well. Um, operating in a scarcity mentality. And then the physical manifestations could be lower back pain, constipation, IBS, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, it may manifest as hormone imbalances, fertility issues, irregular or painful periods, PCOS, endometriosis, fibroids, and then painful or unpleasurable sex. Do any of you, be honest and be vulnerable. We know that this is a safe space. Looking at this slide right now, how many of you think your sacral ch chakra can be a little bit more in balance. How many of you think your sacral chakra is out of balance right now? Kaoli says me, 100%, I'm unbalanced, raises hand, absolutely. Thank you guys for being so honest. The reason that I'm asking this is because Dr. Ashley Rollins is gonna share statistics as to like how many of us have to deal with these sorts of things, but we often, how many of you feel alone in what you deal with? You know, there, there are statistics all over the place, but like we often don't share these experiences because they're what taboo. Many of us are again, uh, Latina, black and brown, you know, from some minority community. And we do not talk about this, which is why I'm so excited to be opening up this conversation. Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing. I see I somewhat alone raises other hand. Yeah, guys, this is a big, big, big deal. Now I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of information on spiritual ways to balance your sacral chakra. Um, which may be like, you may look at this and be like, what? What is meditating on the color orange gonna do? But again, I wanna remind you that all of our physical diseases have energetic roots. So while we are working on our physical bodies, doing things, which I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Rollins talk about in a second, we can balance that out and we need to balance it out with the spiritual self-care aspects as well. So in giving you guys suggestions, I tried to touch on each. Um, sense. 
so meditating on the color orange, just closing your eyes, centering yourself and picturing the color orange. Using aromatherapy, this is one of my favorite, favorite ways when I feel something going on in my body, regardless of where it is happening, using aromatherapy. I love having uh, aromatherapy um, uh, essential oil diffusers. I have one possibly in every room of my house. They're super cheap, $20, $20 on Amazon. For the sacral chakra, you want to use sweet orange, clary sage. Fun fact, for those of you that saw my uh, postpartum video on YouTube, I used clary sage while I was delivering my daughter to sort of like induce a smoother um, delivery. Uh, ylang ylang and jasmine are really, really good. Healthily releasing emotions regularly. So not just like calling your therapist or calling that friend, you know, that you uh, can turn to when you're going through something crazy or something emotional, but regularly sort of flushing the emotional toxins from your body, whether that be journaling, uh, regular therapy, physical activity, reciting positive affirmations. We're going to close this workshop with a really special meditation at the end, so make sure that you stick around. Eating orange colored foods and drinking a lot of water. Again, the sacral chakra is associated with the element of water. So feeling, a, feeling off there could just mean that you need to um, take care of the way that you're nourishing yourself. Listening to sacral chakra binaural beats. You can easily look this up on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple Music, whatever frequencies. We also have chakras or energy centers in our ears. Um, so you can feed yourself that way. And then again, and lastly, uh, is intentionally moving your body and supporting your pelvic health. I cannot stress enough how important it is to balance your self care. This is why the same way that I say it's not all love and light, it's also not all just like spiritual self care or not all just physical. We need to balance it out to get to you know our most our most harmonious bodies and our most uh, most abundant experience. With that, I want to say thank you again to Origin for partnering with me to share this amazing information on how we can treat and heal and form an actual relationship with our pelvis. Right? We don't often think about forming a relationship with our bodies, um, but think about how much time we spend beating ourselves up when something happens. Right? How many of you beat yourselves up when you say, "Oh, my period's coming." Or like, oh, I have another fibroid, or I have a cyst, or you know, I'm having an endo flare up. We're so unkind to ourselves. So being able to switch things around and start to think of how can I form a better relationship with my body, not only my body, but specifically my pelvis. Not I, I love my period. I love that, Brianna. <laughs> Share that energy with the rest of the group. Um, I'm gonna stop yapping. I'm gonna pass things over to Dr. Ashley Rollins, who is our expert on the pelvic floor, and she's gonna talk to us about forming this relationship with our pelvic floor. Let me stop my share. Um, okay. All right, can you guys see my share now? We all good? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I just thought I wanted to kick it off and, and share a little bit of context. And I think, um, Melanie, this is like such a helpful framing. Like I struggle with PCOS. I keep so much like um, tension in my pelvic floor, which I know like um, I only learned since joining Origin that that impacts everything from like, my ability to orgasm, like, you know, how I feel during sex, how I feel about my body. And so, um, hopefully we'll be able to provide just a little bit of context in terms of like, what is this anatomy? What does it do? How's it related? Whether, regardless of what stage of life you're in, whether that be like, you know, in your early twenties and you are like exploring self-pleasure or, you know, just even if you have a period or not, whatever that looks like, um, into pregnancy, postpartum, and then everything that happens in menopause, we really see ourselves supporting women at every life stage. Um, so we're just honored to be able to, to provide some education for you around this part of your body. Um, and then also just, I think the, the biggest thing here too is around accessibility. So like so often a lot of these kinds of services are really out of reach for people who, you know, can't afford to pay two to $300 to like see these PTs. And so a big part about our mission also is just making this care covered by your own insurance. And so, um, and if you don't have insurance, we are, you know, working to also provide additional services there too. So um, excited to excited to share more. And with that, I will turn over to Ashley, who is our the real doctor and expert here. Yes, you guys, I'm so excited to be here. And thank you guys for joining. I know everyone is so busy and it just taking a moment to kind of learn about the pelvic floor and how it how it can relate to your symptoms from a physical perspective. I think is the start of healing a lot of the time, just kind of empowering yourself with the education. I can I love talking about this with groups of women because we don't get enough education and um, it's hard to find the correct 
evidence-based pieces of information, stuff that you can trust, and then how to go and take that information to your provider to try and advocate for yourself and get help. So ask all of the questions. We have some in advance, but I'll continue asking. Allison will pop in with some of those questions and kind of hopefully we can tr touch on everything and get all those questions answered. But we want to talk about the gender bias in healthcare. I saw that pop up so many times over and over in the chat in that in this first section. And it's it's real. <laughs> it's there. It's present. And it's something that we're working through. So let's just talk first. This, there is a systemic bias. And no, you're not hysterical. The irony of that phrase is that the word hysteria comes from the Greek word womb or uterus. There's the, just like that upfront bias in medicine and a lot of the medical terms that we use. Women are more likely to be misdiagnosed, ignored, denied by their doctors, causing well-documented harm. So we have some examples here. You know, less pain medications are provided to women after surgery. And this is despite the fact that they're, they're likely reporting more frequent and more severe pain. Five times, there are five times the number of studies about male erectile dysfunction than there are about pain in, for insects for women. Um, in addition to that, when we're looking at medication doses, the majority of drugs are given with gender neutral doses, despite the side effects. So what we're being given might not necessarily be based on what we need in general. And as early as the 1990s, they were still, you know, providing a lot of the research as it relates to ovarian cancer and other dysfunction, other um, diseases, the, liter the research was coming from the male gender, which doesn't even make a little bit of sense to me. <laughs> so the male default bias, the history of misogyny in medicine is, is um, pervasive and um, male bodies are the default in textbooks. The sex differences don't even show up in the textbooks, even though there are, there are clinically proven differences. And there's lack of training in medical school. Um, nine out of the 96 medical schools in the United States don't have uh, courses on women's health. And even as a physical therapist, so there was a couple of lectures on the basics of pelvic health that wasn't even necessarily specific to women's health. Um, but there's also women, a myth that women are too complex to study. And there's little representation in the clinical research. And like I kind of mentioned, those doses are kind of general neutral. There are a few drugs that are tested on women in general. So let's bring this back to kind of like the physical. Our, we're talking about our pelvis and um, the different chakras. Did I say that correct? Chakras, perfect. How does that relate then to our pelvis, our pelvic floor muscles? What are our pelvic floor muscles? So let's kind of just start off there. You may have heard of them, but you may not have. There are this group of muscles at the bottom of our pelvis. We have a little 3D thing here. Um, they go from our pubic bone to our tailbone and left and right between the two sit bones. So here's our sit bones, our pubic bone on top and our tailbone on the bottom. And this group of muscles here that cover the pelvis on the bottom are our pelvic floor muscles. Our pelvic organs sit on top of them and they form this like basket or hammock of muscles at the bottom of our pelvis that help to support, support the organs, support the joint, support the functions of the pelvic floor. So those big functions, it, and this is really kind of where I love the, the title power of the pelvis because it really is this this powerful part of our body. It is so fundamental in our function. For one, it's our it supports and holds our pelvic organs against gravity. So it's really kind of like the support underneath or like I would think of water underneath the boat kind of helping with the support underneath the boat. It supports our pelvic organs, so it supports their positions and their movement in our body. Um, it also helps to support continence. So those muscles contract and lift. Sorry about that brain from my face, but they support and lift. They also squeeze and close the pelvic opening. So the pelvic openings being the urethra, the vagina, and the anal opening. So they help to kind of constrict that area of the body and close off and allow for continence. They also help with stability. So they help to maintain joint stability of our pelvis. The pelvis is like our foundation where we have, you know, movement above and we have movement below our arms and our, our trunk and our legs that act like levers on the pelvis. It's so foundational to have support and stability there for our movement and our functioning and our daily tasks. 
Um, and they also support sexual function, right? So they wrap around the vaginal opening and they help to support orgasm and arousal, but they also, you know, allow for or don't allow for um, vaginal penetration. Um, and then they also pump. So like the muscles in your legs, they help to kind of pump blood and help to recirculate blood and lymph fluid. Very important muscles, which are very under, under acknowledged, <laughs> like we were talking about. Yeah, there was, um, there were definitely questions too about like, you know, pain with this, like what, what, how do you think about that? How do you like understand where the pain's coming from? Um, and sort of what are kind of different, different causes there? So the pain in our pelvis is very tricky. It's our pelvic area has obviously a lot of innervation. So nerve supply to that area to kind of help with sensation, but it's not like our fingertips where it is very precise and you're able to kind of really feel small um, details. It's so it's an area of our body that can be kind of, I guess I would call it smudgy where you're feeling sensations. And they, but they may be referred from different sources. Um, pelvic pain is very complex, even no matter how you put it. And things like trauma can complicate it even further. Um, our body likes to assign pain and, and kind of no, like, like I feel pain in my bladder. And so then your, your brain is telling you this pain is coming from your bladder. But as a pelvic physical therapist, we know that there are sources of referred pain. And oftentimes things that are mimicking bladder dysfunction or, or um, like um, injury to the bladder itself might actually be pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. So we will go through kind of a bit more about how pelvic pain presents, um, but I will just kind of say it's not straightforward and it's confusing, which is why it's so hard to advocate for ourselves. And I think that's part of the problem we need to get we need to learn more to make it less complicated. So how does this relate to trauma? Trust me, it's not all in your head. Um, just kind of looking at the statistics from, and, and it is so much more than this, but just kind of from the basics, one in five women experience painful sex in their lifetime. And over 30 million women in the United States every year suffer from pelvic pain. And what is that specifically? There's so many different ways to kind of call it. Pelvic pain really is anywhere from like the bottom of your rib cage to the top of your knees. Like it's this really this area of our body where there are um, pain and, and symptoms that um, that are, you know, feeling in that feeling in that area. Um, some of the common issues that you'll see with pelvic pain diagnoses, well, chronic pelvic pain, of course, this might include um, PCOS, endometriosis, fibroids. You might hear the term hypert hypertonic pelvic floor muscles. This really just means increased tone in your pelvic floor, so overactivity or tension. Um, you kind of maybe can think of it like a Charlie horse, like that muscle is tensing and holding, gripping. Um, dyspareunia is a symptom of pelvic pain. Dyspareunia means pain with intercourse. So any type of um, intercourse, externally intercourse, internally, that is painful is, is under the umbrella of dyspareunia and is often a symptom of pelvic pain. Um, bladder and or bowel control issues. It can be incontinence. It can be urgency. Um, it can be um, constipation. Um, frequency, you're running to the bathroom too often. Pelvic organ prolapse. So pelvic organ prolapse is when there's like a, um, a dro dropping of your pelvic organs into either the vaginal area or the rectal area that can kind of bulge into the tissues or even come out of the body. And then menopause symptoms. There's in menopause, you know, there's so many complicating factors there as well as we're aging. There's muscle related decline and bone loss and hormonal changes, vaginal dryness, um, bladder changes, all sorts of things going on that can contribute to um, pelvic dysfunction. Yeah, actually, there was a question too, like around how does like your pelvic floor relate to libido or, you know, is that are those things interrelated? And, and how do you think about sort of the connection there? Sure. There can absolutely be a relation. Um, it's not the, you know, your pelvic floor isn't always the only cause of libido issues, sexual dysfunction, but it's a complicated interplay. Um, there, you know, 
it's almost like chicken or the egg sometimes. <laughs> you have pelvic floor muscle tension that can create pain with, with penetration. And then there becomes a fear that can be associated then with vaginal penetration. That fear can, of course, suppress the libido. Um, pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, so either weakness or overactivity that can present as weakness, maybe a muscle is not functioning as effectively as it could, means that there maybe isn't as much blood flow to the clitoral nerve and um, allowing for some of those erectile tissues to become engorged during arousal. So there is maybe that might feel like a muted response. Um, so we want healthy pelvic floor muscles will have good blood flow, good nerve supply, um, good contraction with orgasm, which has these, it's this rapid muscle um, contraction. Um, that if those muscles aren't strong enough or they're stuck in a contraction, aren't able to function properly for, for arousal and orgasm, if that makes sense. And then again, the pain cycle, if there's pain, then there's less pleasure, there's less ability to have self-lubrication um, and it's just, there's an interplay. But it's always like it, the, there's the muscular dysfunction, there's, can, there's hormones, there's, you know, like you were talking about, Melanie, blocked areas in your pelvis that really it all plays together really like we are blown, all about because yeah i'm like i'm thinking back to like when i was pregnant i experienced a lot of pelvic pain and i and i also experienced a drop in my libido and i went to my um my OBGYN my uh, at the moment um, that i was treating me when i was pregnant and instead of talking to me about what might be happening or giving me the knowledge that you just offered us as i was listening to you i was just like what this makes total sense she told me to just use lube and that's how she sent me out the door. And that's often like, how many of you guys have experienced like a, a, a situation, an interaction like that, where you share something, you know, so intimate and sacred as sex with your, yeah. with your doctor. And all I needed to do was like get some physical therapy done. And, and I experienced it all through my postpartum as well. So, so happy that that's you're sharing so something like that. I yeah. think that I, you know, is for the most part, there is also a disconnect kind of back to that, um, all the misogyny in healthcare, but there is also a real lack of training in sexual function in our, to our, for our physicians and, um, you know, how to ask those questions. There's, there's kind of like this disconnect for them to ask how to ask those questions or even how to follow up with them. Okay. So I have something, I have information. This patient has something going on, but I don't know exactly what to do with it now. I think lubricant should be a fun, welcomed addition to supporting sexual function at any stage. Um, but it shouldn't be the only, and oh my gosh, if you've been told to grab a glass of wine to kind of help with your sexual pain, please that ignore crazy? that advice. That I have heard that so many times. That is not, no, there, there's a reason for pelvic pain and oftentimes it can be a muscle dysfunction. That is really, if you've ever like gotten a Charlie horse, you understand that's a painful muscle experience. And when that nerve doesn't have blood flow, it's pain is a warning sign that something needs to um, be considered and cared for. And oftentimes that is getting blood flow back to that, that nerve or those pelvic floor muscles so that they can function properly. Yeah. And a lot of questions too, actually around like painful periods and cramps. Yeah. Like, um, I, I mean, I know I've been the victim of this. Um, and how do we, I guess, is that, is that, could that be pelvic floor related or how, how do you help, um, you know, patients that come to you with those issues think about that? Sure. There's oftentimes a component of pelvic floor fascia that can be contributing to, so fascia is connective tissue that helps this. It's like this continuous sheet of connective tissue throughout our body that helps to connect muscles with bones and organs. Really everything is connected from your eyebrows to your toenails there is a connection. And I think it's actually almost like a spider web. Like you can kind of pull on a spider web and it really distorts the whole spider web. And oftentimes, you know, pelvic pain as it relates to your period is most of the time multifactorial, but there can be a pelvic component where maybe there is restriction in the fascia so that connective tissue that's not contractile, it can get dry and sticky and pull. Oftentimes we can help decrease the muscular aspect of um, pain with your period by releasing some of those tissues and getting um, hydration back to the area and, um, and good movement. So very, it, it, it can be often helpful. So what should I look for? I felt like we kind of talked about this a bit, but kind of to touch a bit more 
like I said, it can be anywhere from, I mean, really where her hands are, right? This whole area of our pelvis can be affected by pelvic pain. Um, what it feels like, it can feel dull or achy. It can be sharp or like lightning pain. It can feel like pain vaginally or in your vulva, in your labia, in your pubic bone, in your tailbone, um, in your rectum, in your lower abdomen, um, all, all, the, all the places. And so what do you do about it? Well, you know, talk to your provider. It's, but it's not that simple. And I understand that's probably even frustrating to hear because even just the, the statistics are glaring. It's to your point, Melanie, you we're talking about earlier, it's so hard to talk about. And 60% of us, and I'm sure there are some in the group, have a hard time saying vulva and vagina. It's not an easy, they're not necessarily easy, easy things to say, like in your circle of friends. So how hard can it be to see to your provider? And then one in 10 women won't bring up anything that relates to their pelvic floor area because they're afraid of the stigma that comes along with it. Are they going to think that I'm too sexually active or that like I'm, I have a STD or, um, that I'm I'm with sin or whatever it may be, but there is fear to, for kind of disclosing that or asking for help because you're worried about what the response will be. Um, and so ho what I'm hoping though is as part of this talk will kind of empower you to know that you're not alone. It's pelvic floor muscle dysfunction and pelvic pain is very common. Um, and, and I think even just looking at the chat, you guys are like, yes, it is. It's very common. I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist and I have pelvic pain. It will affect all of us. Um, so just know that you're not alone and hopefully having the information here, um, will give you the words, I guess, to use, um, pelvic floor physical therapy can be so helpful for pelvic pain conditions, bowel, bladder dysfunction, sexual dysfunction. It, there's very low side effects from just working with the body and the muscles. Um, and oftentimes we get really good responses um, for our patients. We wanna re-educate these muscles, right? If there is that tension in, pel in those muscles, we teach them to release. We give it back the range of motion, the blood flow and the function that it didn't have before. We use diaphragmatic breathing, stretches, um, body scanning, finding areas of tension. Vaginal dilators or pelvic dilators or pelvic wands, um, also known as maybe pelvic trainers, are oftentimes really great ways to address pelvic pain. I, I had seen a question um, in advance regarding vaginismus. Vaginismus oftentimes can describe um, this kind of like reflexive muscle contraction for any attempts at vaginal penetration and can completely um, prevent vaginal penetration entirely associated with pain and oftentimes a lot of fear for, for good reason. Um, vaginal dilators or pelvic trainers, as they're called, are really great ways oftentimes that we use to help kind of um, decrease that fear. I guess teach those pelvic floor muscles that penetration, pain does not have to be the only response of penetration. Um, they get are gradually um, increasing in size and can be a really helpful way to kind of lengthen and um, I guess train those muscles for vaginal penetration. Ashley, we had a question in the chat around like, can PT really help prolapse and make like using a vaginal cup possible again? Oftentimes, yes. So, and I'll bring my pelvis out again. So remember it's that our pelvic floor muscles are here at the bottom of our pelvis. Um, pelvic organ prolapse is so common. A lot of us have pelvic, or so common, like one in three of us have pelvic organ prolapse, but not that many actually know that they have because a lot of times pelvic organ prolapse can go without symptoms. When something is kind of um, letting us know that something's going on, it's because we have symptoms related to it. Maybe you have that feeling of bulging or pressure in the vagina or you're leaking um, stool or urine. Um, you're like feeling urgency or like you're gonna wet your pants whenever you're running or whatever. Um, oftentimes pelvic floor physical therapy can reduce those symptoms significantly to get you back on your way um, functioning. Um, depending on the grade of the prolapse, so there's different grades as in it might be lower or closer to um, the vaginal or anal openings. 
Um, pelvic floor physical can be, therapy can be more effective at reducing the um, amount of um, dropping that can occur, but it can also be really effective in the symptoms in general. Um, wearing a cup is, is tricky, right? There are so many options out there, luckily, because of that very reason. There's, you know, the, depending on the, the um, height of your cervix, the length of your vagina, the health of your tissues, the bulging of the organs, um, there's different needs for different people. Um, so being able to strengthen those muscles is often the place where we want to go with that to kind of improve that support, improve that water underneath our pelvic organs. And um, that can really help to kind of reposition things and help to make something um, like a menstrual cup more comfortable. I'm thinking that's the cup that they were talking about. Right, okay. And if that didn't answer your question, please um, follow up. All right, so let's hop on to the next slide. So pelvic pain and trauma. The pelvic floor muscles are emotional. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean like emotional in a way that you would back to the hysteria um, word up there. But there are ways that our pelvic floor can manifest trauma or emotions in our body from a physical perspective. So kind of looking at the, the statistics, 90% of people will be exposed to trauma in their lifetime. This, this statistic encompasses a lot of different versions of trauma. This is everything from sexual assault, traumatic medical examination, so medical trauma, birth, violent events, or even a pandemic, which we can all Thank relate you. to at this point in our life. Um, but to go kind of even further, women with PTSD, they tend to have higher pelvic floor muscle activity. So they have that hypertonicity or increased tone, increased tension in the pelvic floor muscles. And of course, after sexual trauma, and it does make sense. Um, if you've ever experienced it, you can feel it. People tend to have higher pelvic floor muscle tone and sexual dysfunction. So just because you have increased tone doesn't mean you're necessarily having symptoms or pain. But oftentimes, if you have um, sexual trauma, you'll, there will be a correlation of um, sexual pain as well. The pelvic floor muscles really are like guard dogs to our body. Um, there's not a lot as, we, as it relates back to education or research in the female body, but there are some good studies to show that that pelvic floor as kind of a part of the overall sympathetic nervous system response. So our sympathetic nervous system is like the uh, part of our, our autonomic nervous system. So our like automatic function, that is our fight or flight. Um, so when we're experiencing kind of a feeling of threat, our body almost like primes to fight or run away or even freeze as kind of like the third response. Um, and our pelvic floor muscles are part of that. So even just in a study, this randomized control trial, um, women watching with pelvic pain and those without watching kind of like more threatening videos will automatically tense our pelvic floor muscles as this guard dog response. You know, it, if you're kind of thinking about it from an anthropological perspective, we're protecting our reproduction area of our bodies. What well, the questions are right I have a silly question. Um, yeah. Is this why like, if somebody ever gets like really, really scared, like why they pee on themselves because of this? Like this possibly, yeah, quite possibly. I couldn't, I couldn't say that for certain, but it is like this automatic body response, right? It's yeah. almost as if we're trying to kind of get rid of the extra weight so that we can flee or whatever it may be. Got it. Um, but chronic overactivity in the pelvic floor can lead to pain. And like I mentioned, poor blood flow, sexual bowel and bladder dysfunction. But if you are someone that's living with trauma and that kind of um, overactive sympathetic nervous system, our bodies are so intelligent, almost to a fault, right? So we have this um, sympathetic nervous system that helps protect us, but it can become sensitized. So if you're constantly kind of like in this overactive, like stressed out and, uh, you know, stress as in like daily stress, but also like this anxious, like trauma stress to our bodies, then it can become like oversensitive to less um, actual threats. And so like maybe like you're running late to get to an appointment. That's not actually something that's going to like threaten your livelihood, but 
our body might sense it like that and can kind of be in this overdrive feeling. And if those muscles are responding, then they can become the connective tissue, that fascia around it can become shortened and it affects the blood flow and turns um, that tension chronic. Um, and the pelvic floor, again, not great research, but there is some showing that the pelvic floor is linked to the part of our central nervous system that's responsible for behavior and emotion. So if you've heard of the limbic system, it's kind of like this deep reptilian part of our brain that really just is responding to the behaviors and the emotions. We have like our fluffier brain on top that kind of helps with our executive control over those responses, but our pelvic floor is more directly linked. So it's almost like this emotional motor system in our pelvic floor. Seeing the synchronicities between the spiritual and the physical, how crazy, right? Well, so I was going to mention, I wrote this down. You talked about it being, um, you know, water being kind of one of those um, areas, one of the key components of that. Associations, yeah. Associations, exactly. From an actual physical perspective, though, looking at water and our health, our bladder health, our bowel health, our sexual health, it's so interconnected, right? If we have dehydration, it affects so our stool because our body needs our body is like mostly water and our body needs water for our essential cellular functions how are we on time you guys these are great questions <laughs> i want to make sure we're not going over <laughs> um we need this water and if it's a, part of the metabolism is you know it's in our stool it's in our urine but our body was going to rob those areas those wastes um, for essential functions. So when we aren't hydrated well, our stool becomes hard and dry and it's hard to pass and we get constipated. And then our rectum fills up and it pushes on our bladder. And then our bladder, maybe we're, we're leaking more because there's so much stool in the rectum that's affecting it. Also, you know, concentrated urine is irritating. Um, so that concentration, um, the acid in the urine can affect our ability to control our leakage and, and the amount of how often we go. And, you know, overall less lubrication uh, because we're have, we have di dehydration that that natural vaginal lubrication is affected as well. So we do, we need the water for our whole health and metabolism wellness. And without it, then our, our bowel function is compromised. Our bladder function is compromised and sexual function as well. Oh. So very connected. So my my biggest takeaway I kind of touched on a bit about the a, a bit on this prior is advocating for yourself and it is hard um as kind of like a, a case in point here is a here is a qualitative study on why Latino patients don't feel like telling their doctors I touched on that point about one in ten women don't like to bring up their sexual or pelvic pain questions with their physicians but it can it goes even deeper when there's the intersectionality of the dispar disparaged health um, healthcare communities. Um, so women and then another community, you know, having the um, more healthcare disparities with the underserved population, it, there, it, it becomes more exaggerated. So this quote, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sure you guys, yeah. And so this is just a quote kind of, um, kind of showing that for an example, I didn't feel comfortable with him. The meaning was too short and fast. He didn't pay attention to what I was saying. He didn't ask me my name. He didn't introduce himself. He went directly to check me and it was the most uncomfortable situation. And that just makes my stomach hurt thinking about that patient experience. And I think unfortunately it's far too uncommon. So how can we advocate for yourselves? I think this, this workshop is like a, a great step. Empowering yourself through education. It really helps to destigmatize some of those things that we have, the fears that we have associated with the symptoms that we're having. It can feel really embarrassing to know, to feel like your pelvic organs are dropping from your vagina or that you leak, but it's so, but you're not alone. And empowering yourself through this education can be a really great way to start, knowing that these symptoms are very, very common, but they're not normal. And it's not something you need to suffer with because there's help. And then speaking up for yourself, so be your own advocate. You know, you know, go back through this presentation and kind of see, pick and pull like, okay, these are the things that I was feeling, or these are the words, and maybe looking more into those, those terms, but being able to talk to your provider about your pelvic pain and not taking, um, just use lubricant or just have a glass of wine as the answer, um, advocating for yourself and saying, no, I know it's bigger than that. And I know that there's help out there for me. The good news is, in California, in Texas, in New York, um, in really in most 
states in the United States, we have direct access um, as physical therapists. So you can come see us directly. You don't need a referral right away to be seen. Um, build your team and your toolbox. I'm a big advocate of just building all of these tools, learning all of the different ways that you can be treated. Physical therapy can help some people. It doesn't help everyone. It's not the, the magic pill. But oftentimes there's, you know, pieces. There's um, pieces of physical therapy, physicians, yoga instructors, acupuncturists, Melanie, please bring her as part of your care team. There's so many ways to kind of build um, your tribe and we're here to support you. And then seek out pelvic PT. There is a connection in your pelvic pain and the trauma and um, your ex life experiences. That is your muscles. That's the connection. And oftentimes we can um, normalize their function for you and tremendously reduce um, the impact on your quality of life. So those are my four tips. <laughs> All right. I know we had a couple questions, but Melanie, I don't know if we have, I know you, we want to make sure we give time for your meditation. I only end, need so. like five minutes and I really want to get to these questions. So let's get to the questions. Okay, perfect. So I know we had one was um, uh, from Zerial, which was can exercise exacerbate pelvic pain? Possibly. It can also help it. So it really just depends on someone's pelvic floor dysfunction. Oftentimes, if we, it depends on your body's like um, strategies and habits. Oftentimes, if we have an overactive muscle, doing things like training that specific muscle group might exacerbate symptoms, especially initially. Oftentimes, what we'll try and do is find where your pelvic floor muscles or where your symptoms are coming from and what that muscle is doing. Is it overactive? Is it underactive? Does it need to be strengthened? Does it need to be released? Oftentimes exercise is this kind of all encompassing. I think people think more of it as like strengthening and like, let's go, go, go. But exercise can also be teaching this muscle to lengthen and use its full range of motion. So oftentimes just the way we tweak and make specific exercises specific for the person that can help them. Great. Um, I know there was a comment about public PT being so expensive and I want to say know, I totally, um, I, I hear you. I think 80% of public floor PT is out of network. And then if you don't have insurance, it's like even more expensive. So um, I will say if you're in California, Texas, or New York, Origin is in network. So I think our average cost is like $15 to $30 per visit. If not, there's a, a great website called pelvicrehab.com that shows all the public PTs in your area. And you can search by people who are in network there too. So um and, and Medicaid is not currently accepted at Origin. We do, we are about to roll out a sliding scale. So stay tuned for that. Um, but I know a lot of the, yeah, and I can post this link and can share this also out in the in the recap, but want to make sure people who need care can get access to it at a, at a rate that, that, you know, they can afford. Um, we had another question that was around, what's the difference with pelvic pain if you um, had a C-section versus if you had a vaginal delivery? I know that um, we have a lot of moms on here, so helping talk through that sure. actually would be awesome. So what, what we'll see is that there's not a whole, okay, so your pelvic floor went through an entire nine months of pregnancy and your pelvic floor, maybe if you had a trial of labor also went through some aspects of the birth and, um, there, so the, it's not just a vaginal delivery that can affect your pelvic floor. It is the entire continuum of um, pregnancy to postpartum. So there is always some aspect of pelvic floor muscle um, vulnerability in pregnancy and delivery. You may, it, it is more common to have urinary incontinence in the postpartum period if you've had a vaginal delivery that tends to normalize by three months postpartum when you're comparing cesarean to vaginal delivery. It might be a tad bit more common to have pelvic pain after a cesarean section. Um, it's a major abdominal surgery and those muscles will respond in, in, in that protective mode and they may be working harder to stabilize and compensate for abdominal muscles when they are um, cut. And so it is, it tends to be more common to have sexual pain um, post cesarean section. It does all tend to kind of normalize out as, as postpartum um, comes, goes along, but it doesn't mean that's something that you just have to deal with for those months um, because there's always something that we can do. I hope that answered the question. I'm curious just 
thinking off the top of my head, how long after um, in your postpartum period do you have to wait to get pelvic uh, PT? So you shouldn't have to wait very long at all. There, we want to work. So I would say try and see a pelvic PT within a couple of days of your postpartum oh, wow. period because in the postpartum period, but for certain things. Now we're not doing any sort of direct muscle treatment, examination, um, exercises per se with the pelvic floor muscles for the first six weeks in the postpartum period. We do want to allow for a lot of healing um, and, and regeneration of tissues and, and shrinking of the connective tissues. We also want to make sure that there are, we're not introducing bacteria to healing um, wounds. But there is a good amount of um, supportive recovery that we can work on in pelvic physical therapy what it's teaching you how to use your, doing the correct body mechanics how to use your muscles correctly because you have to use them how to poop because let's be honest that post first postpartum poop is almost <laughs> as Drastic. intense as the labor <laughs> how to support bladder health all of the things that you can work on while healing um so being seen um immediately is a really great way to start your postpartum healing Somebody just asked Armelis, who just had twins and putting all her business out there. Um, is, it, is there ever, is there such thing as too late for pelvic PT postpartum? No, absolutely not. Obviously we want to try and get you help sooner rather than later. Maybe in your earlier form of healing, um, we can get results sooner. We certainly don't want you suffering for months and months and years, but it's never too late. Even after, you know, even post cesarean, um, you know, six, 10 years after cesarean section, can we work on the scar? Absolutely. There's definitely ways that we can get those muscles. I mean, it's, it's, if you can exercise into your nineties, you, you can still, you know, use your muscles in a way that's therapeutic and benefiting your symptoms. Amazing. There was somebody earlier in the chat who asked, I forget who it was. Oh, I think it was Kaoli who asked. Um, she was experiencing. She's been experiencing GI issues, um, mm -hmm. and through like after colonoscopies and things like that, they haven't found the problem, and they're just like weighing it out as like she's fine. Could that be a pelvic health, uh, pelvic floor problem as well? Possibly. There's a lot of connection between our gut and our pelvic health. Um, it's not a yes, certainly, but it is a wonderful area to explore. If those pelvic floor muscles are in any way kind of contributing to you not being able to empty um, effectively or and, um, and, you know, back up, it, you're, you're being backed up and there is bloating and constipation and abdominal discomfort. Um, it certainly we're, it's a it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful avenue to look towards to see if are those muscles functioning properly to allow for emptying of my bowels um, effectively and easily to kind of support the health of that. But if those muscles are staying staying tight and you're not able to open up the, the around the external anal sphincter here, then um, that can contribute to keeping um, stool in for certain. There you go. Wow. I love that. Um, Amela, I hope I'm saying that correctly, asked this question. Can vibrators cause pelvic health, uh, pelvic pain, excuse me? <laughs> vibrators are wonderful. And they're kind of almost like this, like, mm, it depends kind of category. There are some really wonderful rehabilitation tools with a vibrating component. If for you, though, you are you're using it for pleasure and it's causing contributing to some symptoms like maybe whenever I use the vibrator, I have more intense pain with orgasm or I'm not able to then it might be something that's relevant to you if it's increasing um if it's increasing um stimulation and muscle contraction to that area that might be contributing um but not necessarily in a way that it's like all right throw that out but there might be ways that we can work with that um, with with that with the vibrator with the muscles with the timing kind of retraining those muscles to help but it, it you know in individually it's hard to say obviously not giving specific individualized medical advice at all through any of this but it always depends on the person and what's going on in their situation Thank you for asking that, Amela. Yes, you have a beautiful name. <laughs> you do have a beautiful name. Yeah. Oh, I think there was like one more question, but I'm missing it. There's some great ones that are popping up. Yeah. I think there was one that was, um, can you have PT even if your uterus has been removed oh. um, after four kids? That's can incredible. You 
<laughs> I know. What was the question? I'm so sorry. Can you have pelvic PT if you've had your uterus removed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So if the if the organ has been removed up from the pelvis, the pelvic floor muscles are still there helping to support. Um, and but it would just depend on if there's symptoms, right? Is there um, is there you know, is it, be, you know, what would be causing it or is there a muscle dysfunction that is contributing to some of the symptoms? But just because of a hysterectomy doesn't mean that we couldn't do um, work on muscle function for, for someone individually. I didn't even think about that. So that's an amazing question. I know. All right. And uh, Melanie, should we turn it over to you to close us out? Yes, guys. Thank you guys for all the amazing questions. Oh, uh, thank you Dr. so much. Rollins, if, if anybody has any like random questions that pop up, could they reach you somewhere um, post this after this workshop? Yeah, so we can always be accessed at theoriginway.com. Um, we have a lot of really great resources on our website for to address all sorts of, of questions per se. And you know, we have lots of educational blogs to kind of really just address kind of the general questions that we often times are running across. Um, and then you can from our website sign up for for examination or um, sessions with us to kind of get more information on you specifically, depending on where you are. Um, like we touched on, we um, um, we see patients in California, in Texas, and New York, and um, we're able to kind of help you through your symptoms as, as they come up. So we're so happy to help if you um, need anything in the future. I'm curious to see if, if the Origin Way is expanding because like we need this like all over. We need yeah. this worldwide. This is amazing. Yeah, stay tuned. More to come there. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> Let's manifest it. Let's manifest it using our sacred what? practice. <laughs> Guys, we're going to get into the final portion of this, which is sort of like integrating all the information that we've received. I'm going to do a little bit of energy healing on this um, to sort of like, again, like integrate this, sync this in. So if you can try to find a comfortable spot, I'm going to turn off my camera. You guys can stay on. It's something that I do when I uh, do meditations or do any type of energy healing online. So you guys can't see me. I want you to just find a comfortable spot, whether it's sitting down or lying down is up to you. Just find a comfortable position. And just start breathing intentionally. It's gonna be nothing but five minutes. We're gonna focus on bringing our attention to our pelvis. We're gonna start off with just some intentional breaths first. So you wanna make sure that you're filling your belly with air and releasing, exhaling through your mouth. As if you were building circles with your breath, just keep that going. And start relaxing every part of your body from your toes, your feet, your ankles, just relax your calves, your thighs. Relax your pelvis, let it open. Your belly, let it hang, no need to suck anything in or prop anything up, just let your body be. Breathing, letting your lungs drop. Relax your neck, your head, your arms, your fingers. Just keep that breath steady. for all, almost 40 of us who are here, I want you to visualize a beautiful ball of warm light right over your heads. And we're gonna drop that ball through our bodies and center it right in our pelvis. And then I'm gonna speak nine very powerful affirmations to activate the sacral energy within our sacral chakra, within our pelvis, to integrate the information that we've received today and to awaken it, give it some lively energy to rebalance it. And everybody to know that you're safe in this moment. You're safe to feel whatever it is that comes up, let it flow. Just visualize this warm, 
ball of light right above your head. And as you're breathing, I'm gonna count down from three. And when I say one, we're gonna start the descent down through your body. So take a deep breath in. Three, two, one, exhale. It's dropping in from the top of your head, down your neck, down passing your heart, passing your belly and your solar plexus chakra, going down and resting in your pelvic area, giving this warm, bright, beautiful light to your sacral chakra. I'm gonna repeat each affirmation twice. You can repeat after me if you'd like, or you can just listen, it's totally up to you. And the reason why I chose nine is because nine is a number of completion. Beautiful wrapping up of this energy. My body is in perfect working order. My body is in perfect working order. Pain and discomfort is my body's way of communicating with me. Pain and discomfort is my body's way of communicating with me. I honor my whole self as the sacred vessel that carries my soul. I honor my whole self as the sacred vessel that carries my soul. I honor the emotions that flow freely through me. I honor the emotions that flow freely through me. My emotions are balanced and clear communicators of my soul. My emotions are balanced and clear communicators of my soul. I am comfortable with a life of pleasure in abundance. I am comfortable with a life of pleasure in abundance. Sex is a sacred language I am always getting comfortable with. Sex is a sacred language I am always getting comfortable with. My sensuality is sacred and important for my well being. My sensuality is sacred and important for my well being. And lastly, one of my favorite affirmations most recently I am always remembering who I am, the ever creative universe observing itself in a human body. I am always remembering who I am, the ever creative universe observing itself in a human body. Take a moment, let that light turn up the volume a little bit and give you a little bit more warmth, a little bit more light, lighting you up from within, taking in all the words that were just said, integrating them into your system, into your energetic body, but also your physical body making a promise to yourself and setting the intention to care for yourself intentionally, both physically and energetically, so that you can exist as the most abundant version of yourself. And please don't forget to breathe. And we're gonna safely let this ball of light rise out of you. We're gonna take a deep breath in and I'm gonna count down from three. And we're gonna let this ball of light raise up and out through the top of our heads. Deep breath in. Three, two, one, exhale. Coming up out of our pelvis, passing our bellies, our sake, our solar plexus chakra, passing our heart cavity, going up through our throat and our neck, up into our head, 
and passing through the top of our heads into our crowns with gratitude for having served us in this moment. I'm gonna take some deep breaths, just start feeling your body again, honoring being here today, taking in all this education, all the reminders, because your body already knew all these things. This is, this is a, totally a moment of remembering who you are. Taking deep breaths and feeling your fingers and your toes, your ankles, maybe you roll them a little bit, move your legs side to side, your calves, your thighs. Maybe you wanna stretch your legs open, start to move your neck side to side. Taking a deep breath, moving your body about. Maybe you wanna take one last deep breath in with an audible exhale that always helps wake up the body. Um, and when you're ready, you can open your eyes. I'll turn my camera back on. Let me know how you guys are feeling in the chat. I love closing out workshops in this way, integrating the information that we just learned, whatever it is that we just learned, sort of like installing it in our bodies in a way. How are you guys feeling? Needed that, love that. Thank you, super powerful. Thank you guys for being here today, um, for being here to meet the wonderful ladies of origin. Um, if you guys have any questions at all, you can email me, you can email origin, Addison, can you drop in that email address in the chat? I know you guys are gonna send um, a uh, recap. Um, how long are, is everybody gonna have access to the um, replay of this? We'll just put it on our on our YouTube so um, people awesome. can, can access it there. And yeah, I'll send the recording in case someone had to pop out early or came late. Um, and yeah, I'm dropping our email in the chat. And it was so wonderful. Melanie, thank you for letting us join your community. You got yeah, just incredible incredible group that you've that you've built thank you thank you guys so much i don't often share my community with anybody so this is like a big <laughs> thank thing you. Yeah, for me but it was such a we necessary are honored conversation. we yeah. are I, I, i'm honored as well really a necessary conversation and i'm looking forward to doing something like this on a grander scale one day because this is something that the world really needs to hear absolutely I agree, thank guys. you all so much thank you guys thanks bye, guys. bye.